Barely Dead, written by Jeff Crawford. Chapter 1 It was unmercifully hot, but it was August, so it was supposed to be. The air stirred, but hardly enough to cause all the Spanish moss hanging from the trees to sway. The moss didn't feel dried out and brittle like usual. It was too laden with moisture from the humid rich air that it fed on. In spite of the air conditioning units that were giving it all they had, the skinny young man who was losing his hair prematurely scrubbed his shirt sleeve across his brow again. There was a darker stain on his gray shirt where he had mopped the sweat so often. He looked up when he heard the door open. He'd been waiting for nearly an hour for the man to become free in order to talk with him. He didn't want to have this visit, but he didn't see where he had any other option. All the other things he had tried, they had tried, had failed miserably, and now he didn't know where else to turn. The man walking toward him in khaki pants and a pullover sport shirt was one of the few on the job that still insisted on carrying a revolver. He didn't like the semi-automatic pistols that were so fashionable. He preferred a gun with heft. He wore it in a rig that was slung a little lower than the norm as if he was some sort of gunslinger. He wasn't. He had been the junior varsity backup quarterback in high school and had somehow managed to get himself elected sheriff 12 years later. He was looking at papers held by a manila envelope while he walked. He didn't even see the man sitting on the wooden bench until the lady deputy working the front desk pointed him out. He handed her the envelope and told her he was going home to grab a sandwich and put on a dry shirt. Said he'd be back within an hour, but she could raise him on the radio if she needed anything. Ricky, that man's been here for a while now to see you. Don't you think you ought to see what it's all about before you leave? Joyce asked. Sheriff Ricky Jennings turned around and tried to keep his jaw from dropping. There were four people that he could name offhand that would never voluntarily walk into the police office building. This man and his three brothers were those people. What's the deal, Limley? You trying to sell seeds or subscriptions so you can get a new bike? Ricky asked. The man was talking to Lindsay Walton. Everyone had begun calling him Limley back in school because of the speech impediment. He'd grown out of the speech problem but not how everyone thought of him and his brothers. If there was ever a poster family for white trash, the Waltons were it. Not necessarily bad men, but definitely rowdy. They liked fast cars and cold beer and Leonard Skinner music. Ricky had graduated with Limbley's two oldest brothers. The oldest had been left back a year, so two of them graduated together. Limley's mother had been heard to say that it was the proudest day of her life seeing two of her boys walk across that stage together. Their father had gone running his trot lines that night, so he hadn't attended. I really need to speak with you, Ricky, if you can spare me some time. I hope nothing is seriously wrong. Mikey says he might have to go on food stamps to keep the wife and the two curtain climbers fed since you and your brother stopped coming around his beer joint. Don't tell me all of you got religion and quit bending your elbows, Ricky said. Lembley grabbed at his sleeve again and dabbed at his eyes. Ricky was immediately on guard. There weren't many things any of the Walton boys wouldn't do, and some of them they would do twice if it had been fun enough. But crying in a police station wasn't one of those things. Joyce, would you fill a couple of glasses of ice water and bring them to my office? Me and Lim, uh, uh, me and Lindsay are going to go back there and chat for a little while, Ricky said. It started out as a soft pat to the shoulder, but Ricky eventually squeezed down and urged Lindsay to stand up. Come on with me and we'll sit where it's a little cooler and have a tall drink of something cold while you tell me what's got you all worked up. Now people come in here all the time thinking the world is about to end but you'll see that most times it isn't near as bad as what you've made it out to be inside your head. It's the thinking about a thing all the time that makes it seem worse than it really is, Ricky said. 
Lindsay followed the sheriff as far as the office door and then went in first as he had been invited to do. Ricky was about to close the door when Joyce rounded the corner with two red plastic cups. She handed them off to her boss and told him that she would hold all calls as she reached for the door so she could close it for him, and he winked and walked inside. The payoff for being on call 24 hours a day and 7 days a week is that they bring you ice water when you ask for it and you get your own AC unit, Ricky said as he handed off one of the cups. Lindsay drank slowly from the cup but didn't smile at the comment. Ricky had tried to lighten things up a dab, but apparently he had failed. Ricky was worried and was trying not to let it show. The first thing you learn as a sheriff, or the first thing you ought to learn as a sheriff, is that when someone is in your office and is really wound up, try something, anything, to get them to relax a bit. He knew Lindsay and knew when he was ripe and ready to bust a spring. This was one person who really needed to ease up. Ricky had known Lindsay since the younger man had been five years old. The reason he knew all the Walton brothers so well was because he had run with them night and day until high school when they began to drift apart. His first memory of Lindsay was of using the boy to reach up into the machine in front of Spud's auto shop to steal soda pops. His were the only arms skinny enough to do it. You tend to let little kids hang around if they can put a cold orange soda in your dirty hand for free. How's your mother and daddy? Haven't seen either one of them and I don't know how long, Ricky said. Lindsay took another slow pull from the cup, then took off his filthy Evan Rude cap and sat it softly on the chair beside him. They're doing as well as they can, I guess. Daddy don't get out much on account of that oxygen hose he has connected to him all the time. Those lucky strikes really did a number on him. And Mother stays so down with the arthritis to where she can't hardly do for herself. But they watch television and they make out the best they can, Lindsay said. So why are you here to see me? Is everything okay with your brothers? Ricky asked. He jerked and bent forward, clutching himself, as if an immense cramp had taken hold of him. He tried to hide his face with one of his dirty hands so Ricky couldn't see the new flow of tears. He was soundless, but he was crying again. Ricky made a face and then picked up the receiver to his desk phone. He turned his chair so he would be mostly sideways to his desk and he whispered into the phone, Joyce, bring me a box of tissues, please. I don't know that we have any tissues here, Sheriff, she said. Well, bring me a roll of striking paper from the ladies, John, or some paper towels then, and I'll meet you at the door, Ricky said. He watched her shadow pass by the frosted glass that was inset in his door before he rose from his desk. Lindsay was starting to get some control, but a little more time to himself wasn't going to hurt anything. He closed the door softly and handed Lindsay the roll of bathroom tissue. The man didn't say anything but immediately pulled off several squares and blew his nose into them, and then he drank some more of the water. Where are your brothers, Lindsay? Ricky asked. A look spread across the young man's face. Ricky had seen that look before on others who had sat in the same chair. It was the look people got when they had already said too much and were trying to figure out how to get out without saying more. This was always the hard part for a sheriff. You had to decide whether to go and sit beside the person and coax out of them what needed to come out, or go hard at them and jerk the story from them. If you chose incorrectly, there usually wasn't a second try. Where are your brothers? Ricky asked more forcefully. You've acted strangely enough that I'm going to dig until I find out with or without your help, so you might just well tell me right here and right now. Lindsay sat the plastic cup on the desk and gave his nose a final wipe with the wadded tissue paper before speaking. Willard and Roy Ed are dead. Cecil, I'm not sure where Cecil is. Not for sure I'm not, Lindsay finally said. Ricky sat back in his chair and took a deep breath. The boys were rough and rowdy and most folks around didn't trust them, 
but Ricky still considered them friends even though he didn't see them all that often anymore. The news came as a hard blow to his gut and his memories. Does your mother and daddy know anything about any of this? Ricky asked. Lindsay shook his head back and forth. It might kill Mama and they would start worrying about funerals, but there isn't anything to bury Ricky, Lindsay said. What do you mean there isn't anything to bury? How do you know that they're dead if there aren't any bodies? Maybe they just went off on a drunk and parked their car in a lake or in a ditch somewhere in the middle of nowhere. It's happened before. You know it has. You were with them a couple of times. It was a week before anyone saw hide and hair of any of y'all. They're probably just trying to get their car to run it again. You know Willard, once he starts tweaking on an engine, he doesn't think of anything else until he's got it the way he wants it. Lindsay was shaking his head violently back and forth. That isn't what happened this time. Trust me, Ricky, I know, Lindsay said. Well, what exactly do you know? I think you best tell me everything about all this, and I mean everything, Lindsay. This isn't stealing highway signs to hang on the side of your shed. You've come in here talking about people being dead, but no bodies to bury. You can't hide any of this away, Lindsay. It's too serious this time for that, Ricky said as he removed his pen from his pants pocket while he was sliding a yellow notepad to the center of his desk to write on. Now wait a minute before you start. Where is Annie Lee? Ricky asked. Lindsay winced a little at the sound of his sister's name. Ricky was confused as to why he'd had the strange reaction. Either something had happened to her also, or he had been wanting to avoid her being mentioned altogether for some reason. Ricky just didn't know which it was. She was just as rough as her brothers in some ways, but as pretty as a picture when she wanted to be. Ricky had always thought it unfortunate that Annie had been born a Walton. She could have made something of herself with a little bit of the right push. Annie Lee's home seeing after Mom and Daddy, Lindsay said. So she doesn't know anything about what you're talking about to tell me, Ricky asked. Well, she does and she doesn't, Lindsay said. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You're the one who came in here crying about all this. You need to stop making me drag it out by threads and start telling me what's happened. I'm going to bounce you off of a few walls and then I'm going to go find out anyway. Do you understand me? Ricky asked. Joyce looked up from her desk and peered in the direction of Ricky's office. He didn't lose it very often, and that's a good thing if you're the sheriff, but when he did, the whole station could hear him coming unglued. She had always felt nervous or soiled whenever he had to be around any of the Walton brothers, but now she was feeling sorry for the youngest one. Come in here with nerves all jangled and then to have Ricky unload on him... She went back to her work and tried not to hear what was taking place a dozen steps from her desk. Chapter 2 Start at the beginning, Lindsay, and I mean now. Don't cry, don't be sipping that water, and don't leave anything out. Now you know me, you know when I'm not fooling around. Now Lindsay, I'm not fooling around here, Ricky said. I know that you're not, and I'm really trying, but this is hard as hell, Ricky, Lindsay said. Ricky softened just a little, but only a little. He consciously relaxed his shoulder so he wouldn't appear so looming. There was no good cop, bad cop type thing here. There was only cop and old friend. True enough, he had to be the cop here, but Lindsay needed a friend right now. Go ahead, Lindsay, and I'll try not to bark so much going forward. You take your time and you tell me everything, but don't leave anything out no matter what. It might not be important to you, but it could make a world of difference to me. Now, are you ready? Ricky asked. Lindsay nodded his head and reached for the red plastic cup, but remembered what Ricky had said and withdrew his hand. Do you remember J.C. Plimpton? Lindsay asked. Ricky scrunched up his eyebrows and concentrated. You mean Wiggs, boy, don't you? I had forgotten about him. It's been so long since I saw him last. He went away to school, I think. 
What does he have to do with all this whatever it is, Ricky asked. He did go away to school, but he came back. Couldn't make the grade, and they gave him the boot. He's been working over in Greentown, stripping copper out of air conditioners and such at a scrap yard. He isn't ever going to be an extension agent like Wig wanted him to be, but copper is high, so the pay is pretty good. Enough to where you can drive around in one of those fancy pickup trucks that has four doors on it. He's been back a couple of months now, maybe three. Aren't a lot of people around that know about him being back. Wig wasn't none too happy about having to go fetch him, so he hasn't been doing much crowing about J.C. coming back home. I guess most could understand why. Of course, my mama carried on to beat the band every day we came home from school without a note for fighting or eating the damn glue. Anyway, J.C.'s back, and one Friday night, he was tooling around in that shiny truck, and he happened to go to Shake's to grab a burger for his supper. And who do you think brought it out to him? Lindsay asked. I don't have to guess. I was tickled for Annie Lee when she got herself hired on over there. She's real personable and I was betting that she would be a real hit with the customers. Your sister has yet to meet a stranger, Ricky said. Well, she must have been a big hit with one. Her and J.C. laid eyes on each other and they must have thought that they had invented falling in love. They went ahead over heels for each other and was connected at the hips from then on. She was working all the time, so he would go and eat there and then bring her home after she would get finished with her shift. Everything was all good and he was nice enough guy to have hanging around. We would all be sitting on the porch with Daddy, you know, having a cool one or two, and J.C. would come driving up and he would always scoot around the front of that truck in a hurry and open the door so Annie Lee could get out. She'd give him a little peck on the cheek once they made it up to the porch, and then she would go inside to see about Mama while J.C. sat on the porch with us for a few minutes. Seemed like everything was going the way things ought to go. But then one night, we sat there, and they didn't show up. Now, Ricky, I don't have to tell you how Willard has always been. He was a good man, but sometimes he did things without thinking it through all the way. He was always like that, but especially when it came to Annie Lee. Roy Ed was a lot like him, but when it came to Annie Lee, Willard didn't allow for no foolishness. Willard wasn't a saint, and I know it, but as soon as Annie Lee came along, he watched over her like a hawk, because he knew Daddy wasn't ever going to, and Mama couldn't. Lord, but he was as protective of that girl like she was his own. Strict as he was with her, I still always admired that about Willard. Like I said, we were all sitting on the porch pulling a tab or three and it kept getting later and later, but there wasn't any Annie Lee to be seen. Cecil went and called down to Shakes to see if she was working late. June said that in fact she had asked if she could get off work half an hour early. Since she had been working so much and doing such a good job, they told her it would be fine. Cecil asked her where Annie Lee had gone, and June said she didn't have any idea, but wherever she went, she was getting there in a big shiny truck. Now, I'd seen Willard mad before, same as you have, but I had never seen him throw a fit like he threw that night. Lord God, but I thought he was going to shout the paint right there off the walls. I tried to calm him down by saying that they had probably gone somewhere to get something or another to eat that was different than shakes, or maybe they had gone to the picture show. Annie Lee had never gotten to go to many pictures, so, but she sure did love it when she could go. But being born a little brother means you're always the little brother, and I took a pretty good smack across the ear for talking instead of letting the older brothers weigh in. I think I would have gotten more than one, but Roy Ed stepped in. I knew that Willard was worried and upset that he wasn't really mad at me, but that didn't make my ear quit stinging. Now Cecil agreed with me and figured that they had gone to the late show down at the cinema, but Willard threatened to slap him too. Willard didn't care where they had gone. What bothered him was that he hadn't been told or asked first. 
Now, Cecil reminded him that Annie Lee had been out of school for nearly three years and didn't have to ask his or anyone's permission concerning where she went or who with. Now, Ricky, you ain't ever seen such a dog fight in your life as went on after Cecil said that. Roy Ed got his dang nose broken just trying to stop him. Finally, everything settled down a bit and Willard was still stomping around trying to figure out what he should do. And then Daddy spoke up. Of all things he could have said, what he chose to say was probably the worst. He could have said that maybe they had been in a wreck and we might want to try calling the hospitals here and in Greentown. Or he might have said that some bad ones jumped up at the truck when it was stopped at a red light and took it from J.C. and left them standing next to a ditch somewhere. You know, he could have said anything, but here's what he said since he was the oldest and wisest there. He said that those britches she was all the time wearing that were so tight, you could read the date on a dime when it was still in her back pocket. Wasn't because her hind end had gotten bigger and she was growing out of them. He said that she was wearing them that way on purpose because her sap was up and she was ripe and ready to do something about it. He said Mama used to be the same way back when she was worth looking at. He said to sit down and drink a cool one. Annie Lee would be back when she was done getting her oil checked. Now Willard went through the roof after that. If he had known where to go right then, I swear he might have just tore out running. But Cecil got him calmed down enough to convince him to hand over the car keys. He told Willard that since he had better eyes, he'd be better at spotting the truck while Cecil paid attention to the driving. I still don't know how that worked, but it did. So we all piled into Willard's charger and we took off. We didn't know where we were going, but we were making good time. Mainly Cecil was just driving around hoping that Willard would cool off. Maybe even give those cool ones a chance to kick in and him pass out. If we could get him back home and let him wake up to find Annie Lee sound asleep in her bed, She might get a gnawing on come morning, but she would have skipped the worst of the storm. But we were almost to town. I mean, we could see the lights from Maxie's store and Willard hollered that we needed to turn around. We didn't none of us believe it, but we weren't going to argue with him, seeing as that was what we all wanted anyway. But just before we got to the turnoff, he told us to keep going straight. Roy Ed asked him where we were headed. Willard said then when he had been cleaning up the car to spray the primer, which is as far as he got, he had emptied out the truck at the old sawmill we used to use. He had been down there cutting some hickory handles for a couple of gold devils that had been broken over at the sawmill. He wanted to pick up a couple of those hickory handles in case we found J.C. since he didn't have a gun in the car. Willard was going to kill J.C. without knowing if he had done anything wrong? Ricky asked. Well, I told you that I had never seen Willard as mad as he was that night. Cecil was glad enough to do as he had been told. Every minute that we were driving around where we were meant that was one more minute that we weren't in town where J.C. and Annie Lee were. So we just drove on down the road and passed the bridge until we went by the new mill, and then we slowed down to turn into the old mill driveway. Well, that was when I knew we were in trouble. It was when I knew that everyone was in trouble. It might as well have been Christmas lights blinking, down by the old drying shed and sort of tucked around the back. Two red lights kept flashing on and off and on and off and on and off. Lindsay said this before drinking some water and rubbing at one of his temples with two of his fingers. Okay, buddy, what was down there? What was making the light? Ricky asked. Lindsay stared back at him. There was an expression on his face that screamed how he did not want to say anything more. The expression was begging the man who had once been his friend to please not make him say anything else. Ricky knew without a doubt that what he was going to hear was going to be something he'd rather not and would probably never be able to forget. But it was his job to hear these things and then act accordingly. Being the sheriff wasn't all about riding the Christmas parade float trailer ahead of Santa Claus. 
It was about having to do the hard stuff because no one else would. Still, he'd have given anything to let Lindsay off the hook just then and told him to walk away and never think about it again. The little guy was pitiful and Ricky felt for him. They were brake lights, Ricky. They were brake lights that kept being activated. There was enough moon as we drove down the road with no lights on to see that it was brake lights of J.C.'s truck. We could see two people in the truck and they were both in the driver's seat. I've never been so scared in all my life. Not because we could have been running someone off. You know, we've done that before. I was scared because I knew there was going to be no way in hell that we were going to get Willard stopped this time. Well, Cecil slowed down so we could come to a stop and talk about what we needed to do. And that was a mistake. We should have just thrown the car in reverse and floored it all the way to the highway should have driven until we were out of gas. We should have driven until we were 200 miles from that mill and give Willard a chance to cool down as he walked for three days back home. But that isn't what we did. He slowed down and Willard was out of the car and running while it was still moving. He cut across the old holding yard while Cecil drove as fast as he could to get there ahead of Willard, but it wasn't fast enough. Willard jerked that door open and J.C. and Annie Lee came spilling out on the dirt. Both of them had their britches down around their ankles. J.C. had been resting one of his feet on the brake pedal. Do I have to say any more about that part, Ricky, because I really don't want to? Lindsay asked. Ricky shook his head back and forth and told Lindsay that he had the picture well enough. Now Willard lay into J.C. like he was on fire and Willard was trying to beat out the flames. Annie Lee was screaming and crying and wailing on Willard's back, but I don't think he ever knew it. J.C. was trying his best to crawl away, but Willard wasn't letting up. He kept hollering things about defiling and ruining Annie Lee while he kicked and hit J.C. And when he was too tired to beat on him, He made Cecil and Roy Ed drag J.C. over to the shed we used to saw logs under. All the equipment was gone, but there were some ropes hanging from the rafter beams. The only reason Cecil and Roy Ed did as Willard told them was because they thought Willard was going to string J.C. up for a day or two to teach him a lesson, you know. Let him hang there and think about what he'd done. But when Willard walked back over with one of those hickory handles... We all knew it was over for J.C. Before any of that started, I took Annie Lee back to the car and got her into the back seat. I could see, but I wouldn't let her watch. I just let her lay her head over my shoulder and cry while Willard went to town on him with that piece of hickory. It didn't take long before J.C. stopped making any sounds, but it was a while before Willard had done what he had thought was enough. You know how a deer looks when you've hung it up and skinned out ready for butchering. Well, that's how J.C. looked. Willard covered in blood and Cecil and Roy Ed had a good bit on them, too. They had sort of gotten into the swing of things the longer Willard had gone. They kept him from spinning around so Willard would get a good square shot each time. I watched my brothers stand there with their hands on their knees trying to catch their breath after beating J.C. to death. And I watched him kill a man for doing only what Annie Lee had allowed him to do, and for all I know had invited him to do, just like Daddy said. Willard and Roy Ed drove J.C.'s truck down to the low bridge and pushed it off in the water, and then they washed themselves up before they got in the car. And Cecil was driving because I was still in the back with Annie Lee, and I could smell the blood strong enough on Cecil that I thought I was going to throw up. Nobody said a word all the way home. It was the next morning before we did anything with Jacy's body. Chapter 3 Lindsay, did Jacy's daddy come after your brothers? Is that what happened to him? Ricky asked. No, sir, I wish it had been that way. All of this might have been easier if it had happened like that. Well, what did happen, Lindsay? What happened after Willard and your brothers did what they did? Ricky asked. We got up early the next morning. Heck, we had never gone to sleep. 
Willard and the others were still too wound up, and I was too scared to sleep. We'd done our share of devilment, but we had never done anything like this before. I know my brothers could have tempers that could get loose now and then, but I didn't know who they were that night, Ricky. The more they did to J.C., the more they acted like they enjoyed it. That wasn't my brothers. They aren't like that. They were acting like Daddy used to act, and none of us ever wanted to act like Daddy. But we got up and we started stirring and we all knew we had a busy day ahead of us. We were getting a bite to eat and all of us except Willard. We had gone in and was having a talk with Annie Lee before we were going to leave. I don't know what he said to her, but he told us later that she knew not to open her mouth about any of the mess that happened at the mill. Willard didn't want it getting around about what happened to J.C. and Annie Lee didn't want it getting back to Mama about how she'd been being with a man in that way. So her and Willard came to an agreement about it all. Willard told us that all we had to do now was get rid of J.C. and then forget it all. Said you and the other deputies couldn't find your butts if y'all used both hands. By the time we got to the old mill... Willard and my two brothers were starting to laugh about it all, and I was still doing everything I could not to cry, and they were making fun of me over that. I had been hoping that something might have come by and gotten J.C. during the night, you know, like coyotes or wild hogs, but he was still hanging there by his ankles. I ended up taking a pretty good beating from Willard for crying and throwing up in the back seat of his car. The only way I knew it was J.C. hanging there because I was there when he was hung up there. There wasn't anything now but one big bloody bruise and the smell. There isn't any way for me to tell you how bad that was. Well, on the way to the mill earlier, Willard had told us that we were going to take J.C. in and wrap him up nice and tight in canvas and then put him in the shade so he would keep better. After dark, we'd take him over behind Solomon's where that old graveyard is. Willard wanted to dig up one of those old graves and put J.C. in there with whoever had been there already. But no one ever visited that graveyard anymore, so he figured that'd be the best thing to do. But J.C. stunk so bad that Willard said we couldn't wait until dark. He was already rotten, another 12 hours in the heat, and we wouldn't have been able to go near him. Roy Ed said that he believed J.C. smelled like he had turned because Willard had wailed on him so much that his insides had started creeping out to the outside. I don't know about that, but I just knew it was the worst thing I had ever seen up to that point. So even with all of us gagging and heaving the whole time, we got him wrapped up and tied tight. And then we put J.C. in one of those old oak boards that had been culled last year because it had been too wide. Cecil and Roy Ed hefted him up on their shoulders. Willard grabbed a couple of shovels and started leading the way, and I grabbed the other two shovels and followed them. Didn't any of us know where we were going, but Willard acted like he knew what he was doing. I don't think he did. I think he was acting like Willard had always acted. He'd always been too proud to say that there was something he didn't know. And ever since he killed J.C., I don't think he knew a thing except that he was as scared as the rest of us. But Willard wasn't ever going to admit such a thing. Daddy taught him in a hard way not to ever show that you're scared whether you are or not. We finally came to wherever Willard had in mind or he was just as give out as the rest of us were. We all must have walked for two hours or more. We had to stop several times along the way because J.C. kept tipping off the board. Each time he hit the ground, some of that rotted smell came out in a blast. I mean, he was stinking the whole time, but when we would flop down on the ground, it was something else. Cecil finally took off his and Roy Ed's belts and latched them together and strapped J.C. down to that board but every 10 or 12 feet their pants would start slipping and me and Willard would have to lay shovels down so we could hike their britches back up for them. But we finally arrived and it turned out that I knew where we were. We had just gone the long way around to get there. Where did you take J.C. and bury him, Lindsay? Ricky asked as he looked up from his yellow pad. 
I'm not sure I want to be telling you where he was at. If you were to go find something, Cecil and me could get into trouble. I mean, if you have actually body parts and all, it could be bad for us, Lindsay said. Ricky snatched at the plastic cup of water that Joyce had brought him and threw the contents into Lindsay's face. You are already in trouble, you idiot, Ricky yelled. Do you think that just because something happened to Willard and Roy Ed, you're going to walk away from all this because you told me what happened to them? The four of you killed a man and an innocent man at that. I don't care how bad he smelled or how much you cry in my office. You're going to tell me where J.C. is, and if I don't like what you say, I'll put a leash on that skinny neck of yours and make you lead me to him. Now you tell me where you buried the man all of you murdered. Lindsay was using the tail of his shirt to wipe his face when Ricky started to stand up, but he sat back down again. What did you mean by that? You said you didn't want to tell me where J.C. was at. Is he not there any longer? Did you morons go dig him up and bury him a second time? Ricky asked. Well, I was getting to that before you threw your water all over me. It's no wonder you and Willard used to be buddies. You act a lot like him sometimes. We took J.C. to where Willard had picked out and Willard and me started digging. Cecil and Roy Ed was give out from toting J.C., Everything was going, I guess, as well as it could, but the more we dug, the less we wanted to. I don't mean because we were tired or lazy. It was because J.C. was laying right there beside where we were digging, and we could smell him. We knew what he looked like under that tarp, and we knew he was looking at us because he never had closed his eyes when he died. Cecil said that the dead can see through things like pieces of canvas, and we were tired of J.C. watching us dig his grave. So it was only about a half as deep as we had planned on digging when we climbed out and rolled J.C. down in that hole. It wasn't even as deep as we thought it was. J.C. was about even with the ground, but we weren't about to reach in there to fish him out so we could dig through all those roots and hard ground just to gain another foot. Willard guessed that it would be good enough since no one had been back there in 50 or 60 years. Every now and again, Roy, Ed, and me would go through there if we were trying to kill a deer or sometimes dogs would run in that area because it was always a good coon hunting, but people other than us never went back there. We were about a half a mile from where Granddaddy used to cook liquor. The still house he built so he could stay there for sometimes a week at a time is still there and it's in good enough shape that we'd stay during the hunting season. I always liked going there even if I wasn't hunting because it's real quiet there. It just makes me feel good when I'm there or it did. Probably not now. Well, we buried J.C. as best and proper as we could. Well, maybe not as proper as we could have, I don't guess. He wasn't in a coffin. He just barely was in the ground. But he shouldn't have been doing what he'd been doing to Annie Lee. So I guess he got as good as he deserved. We covered him up with the dirt we had dug out of the hole, and then we scooted some leaves and sticks over everything. And I thought we were done and was going to go back home. We still had work to do and I was already beat to my socks, but Willard said that the work would have to wait. Him and Roy Ed were going down to the still house and cleared out of snakes and such. Me and Cecil, we went back home and gathered up enough stuff to live on for a couple of three days and a rifle or two. I didn't have any idea what he was thinking about, but they went to the still house and Cecil and me headed back. As we were walking, Cecil told me that in case anyone happened to see anything or just got nosy, Willard wanted to be around the grave for a while. You know, until he was sure that if anyone was looking for J.C., they were looking for him somewhere else. Cecil said we were supposed to take it in shifts for a few days. That night, Cecil and me would stay there and watch out for anything strange, and in the morning... Willard and Roy Ed would come early and take over. Mama and Daddy were kind of used to one or more of us being gone all night, either running lines on the river or shooting eight ball at Tim's, 
so they probably wouldn't think anything about not seeing us. And Annie Lee, according to Willard, knew good and well not to open her mouth about anything. Well, I didn't think all the carrying on was needed, but you didn't argue with Willard, especially not then. So Cecil and me made it back and did some work that needed to be done, and then we gathered up everything that we were supposed to, and we headed back. And since we knew where we were going this time, we knew the quicker way to get there, and the hike wasn't so bad. Willard was all ill over us taking so long, but he got over it quick enough. They left, and Cecil and me sat around until we started to get hungry, and we made supper out of soda crackers and potted meat. And as soon as it was dark, we both went to sleep. Willard had told us that one person was to be awake at all times, but Willard wasn't there, and we were tuckered out. We had already hiked that ridge line three different times, not to mention done a half day's work and buried a fella. We were sleeping like logs until we heard the damnedest racket you've ever heard. We knew where it was coming from, and that was a half mile away, but we could still hear it as clear as a bell, but it surely wasn't as nice sounding as any bell. We sat there all night listening to that noise. Now, I'm not too proud to admit that Cecil and me were scared just about out of our minds. We had those rifles, and we both knew how to use them. We know how to use them better than most around here, but we never fired a shot. We couldn't see a thing. Yeah, there was a good moon, but it was so thick back where we were that there wasn't any light enough to get through those trees. That's why Granddaddy cooked liquor back there. You can't see anything back there, but you can sure hear a lot. Up about an hour before sunrise, the noise just stopped. I mean, stopped like it had never been there to begin with. I knew what Cecil was thinking, so I told him right straight up that I wasn't setting foot outside of the still house until it was light outside. He said Willard was going to pitch a fit, that we heard all that noise and didn't go look around. And I said that Willard had already caused my nerves more bothered than I deserved. When Willard stays the night, he can go run down all the noises he wants to, but I wasn't going to budge an inch until I could see what was in front of me. And just as it was getting light enough to see, we had stepped outside to take a leak and then have a look around, and we heard Willard and Roy Ed coming. It's about to hit the fan again, Cecil whispered to me. So we told them about how we hadn't done any sleeping on account of all that we were hearing and where we thought it was coming from. Willard was a lot calmer about it than I would have thought him to be, but he did accuse us both of being old women and said we were all rattled because J.C. and that it was just the usual night noises you hear out in the woods, coons and possums running around tearing up jack and owls and bats and flying around. He jerked the rifles out of our hands and handed one of them to Roy Ed, and he said that if we were afraid to use them, then we shouldn't be allowed to carry them. We went off toward where J.C. was buried because me and Cecil was sure that the noise had come from there. Willard wouldn't even speak to us the whole way there. Well, there was real good light by the time we got there. I'd been scared of being there in the dark. I'm not scared of much, Ricky, but I didn't want to be at that grave in the dark. And I was hoping that the grave would be hard to spot. You know, I was hoping we'd done a better job of filling it in and covering it up than I remembered us doing. And I figured if we couldn't see it right off, then no one was ever going to see it. Make it into the fall of the year and all those leaves come down again and it would disappear completely. That's what I was hoping, but that wasn't what we found. That grave was open, just like we had just dug it. Little scraps of canvas was here and there, and then most of it was still in one piece a bit further away beside the cord we had tied it up with. There were pieces of J.C. there, too. Not enough that you could tell which part was what. It was just pieces of him. You didn't see him right off, but you smelled him, and that led you to where the pieces were. Roy Ed was the best of us in the woods, and he could read signs like other people read books. He made out the first bear track in those leaves. 
Hey y'all, let's take a little intermission here in this really cool story. I hope you're enjoying it. Let's talk about Yeti bars for about 30 seconds. If you haven't tried Yeti bars, you need to go check out their website, yetibars.net, and look at all the soaps and deodorants and all of the products they have for sale. A couple of their new products, they have the new sour apple bar. I'm looking at a picture of it right now and it looks really good. They also have a new bar called the IPA bar that seems to be kind of a hoppy scent, kind of a beer IPA scent. I'm going to buy some of that. They've got the hippie number one deodorant back in. They've got the shroot deodorant. Everything's marked down. Go check them out at yetibars.net. Use the code DC10 at checkout and get a 10% discount. Let's get back to the story. Chapter 4 Roy Ed was all for tracking the bear. Like I said, he was the best of us when it came to knowing what was in the woods. There never has been an animal that he didn't want to track just to see if he could. Willard was asking him why he wanted to follow that bear, but he was grinning to beat all when he was asking. A lot of the time you see Willard when he's not in a bad mood. But it isn't all that often that you see him in a good mood. You know what I mean? Ricky nodded his head up and down and then gestured that Lindsay should continue. Willard said that the only reason to track the bear was to give it a big hug. We had no idea what he was talking about until he pointed at the grave. There isn't a body for anyone to find now. The bear's already eaten it and what he hasn't eaten he's reburied so he can have it later. The worse a piece of meat smells, the more bear likes it. This doesn't mean that everything's picture perfect, but it's gotten us a lot closer. That bear did us the biggest favor he could have by digging up old J.C. I had all the confidence in the world in Roy Ed, but I asked him what it could be if it wasn't a bear. There used to be bears around, and Daddy and his people killed a couple. That was 50 or more years ago. Now and again, someone will see one on the side of the road or down in the push box where folks throw their garbage when they compact it. But for one to be running around in these ridges is curious. It's a bear, nothing else. A good size one, judging by the size of the tracks, Roy Ed told me. I said the next thing you'll say is that it's probably a grizzly because his feet are so big. And whack, Willard backhanded me all the way to the ground. It's just an old black bear that got a whiff of J.C. and came to get an easy supper, he said. Now shut up about what kind of bear it was, or whatever it was. Doesn't matter. What matters is J.C. is inside of it now instead of in that grave where we put him, he said. Cecil started back toward the still house, and then Willard hollered at him and asked where he thought he was going. He said he was going to collect his share of the stuff that we had brought the night before, and then he was headed back. He said he enjoyed all this killing and bearing and sitting up and listening to Dad getting eaten all he wanted. He wanted to get back and get some work done so he could take a nap for a while. Willard said that he wasn't going anywhere, and he sort of pointed that rifle he was holding at Cecil. We've all had our fair share of fights with each other. People think we used to get into a lot of fights in school, but we always just fought each other more than we ever fought anybody else. But that was the first time any of us had pulled a gun on one of us. Willard said that the bear may have dragged J.C. away to eat him, but he left a lot of scraps that no one ever needed to see. So for the next hour, all four of us walked around and sometimes crawled around picking up little pieces of canvas or cord or pieces of J.C. We hunted until we couldn't find anything else and then we took all those little bits and bobs and put them in the hole where J.C. had been laid to rest. We started filling in the grave and Willard started to laugh. I thought everything had finally gotten to him and he had blown a coal or something. He'll smile some, especially when he's drunk, but you don't hear him laugh all that much. Not even when someone's telling jokes on a TV show. He never laughs. It was strange hearing him, especially because of where we were. For some reason, I think I'll always remember what he said when he stopped giggling. 
We asked him what he thought was so funny. And there we were, all four of us, down on our knees, putting all those pieces back in that hole. And all he said was, Old J.C. was carrying on to beat the band while he was getting beat. But I bet if you could ask him right now, he would say that he would take a beating over being eaten any day and twice on Sunday. Well, I don't think I'll ever forget him saying that or how he looked when he said it. Ricky held his hand up and said, Lindsay, you're doing a fine job as a storyteller, but I really need you to pay attention to the task at hand and get to the point. I know you're still trying to work through all this and get it out from inside you, but I'm the damn sheriff, not a friend from the past. You already told me about how all y'all killed a man, and you claim they killed him, Ricky, not me. I was just sitting in the back seat with Annie Lee watching him do it, Lindsay said. You sitting there watching without trying to stop it is the same as you being the one that was wailing on him with that go-devil handle. And instead of going for groceries and guns... Did you ever consider coming and telling me what the four of you had done? Now, if you had, it might have helped you and Cecil keep your stones off the hook. Maybe your two brothers would still be alive if they are in fact really dead. You haven't said anything yet to make me believe that they are. So far, all I know is that they're worse men than I ever believed them to be. Now, quit telling me about Willard giggling around the grave and get on with it. Or you're going to see the side of me that you've never known existed, Ricky shouted. From the receptionist's desk, Joy slammed the folder shut that held the files that she had been working on. She told Deputy Hamrick that she was going outdoors to have a badly needed smoke or maybe two. Hamrick had heard the raised voice of their boss and asked if he could join her. He was pouting. He wasn't one to hide it when his feelings had been hurt and Ricky didn't care. He couldn't have cared less if Lindsay was feeling put upon. All that mattered was that Lindsay was talking again. He'd been silent for a couple of minutes while he pouted after Ricky had yelled at him, but finally he continued the tale. And if Ricky knew him at all, it wouldn't be but a little dab and Lindsay would be back to acting like Lindsay again. We all went back to the still house after we had the grave filled back in and covered over with leaves and sticks again like before. It looked more natural after we left it that time, not like it had before, being humped up and all. I guess that was on account of J.C. not being in the grave any longer. Well, I started to sit down on the floor because there wasn't any furniture to sit on. And about that time, Cecil came through the door. He was going to look through that poke of food and had brought to find himself something or another to eat since he hadn't had any breakfast yet. But Willard told him not to bother. What do you mean don't bother? Cecil had asked. We haven't had a bite since last night and that one hadn't been much of one. Willard told us that we could eat later on when we were back at the house just like always. He told us to go back to work at the mill like it was a normal day and then go to the house for supper like we always did. That way nothing will seem unusual. Him and Roy Ed were going to stay at the still house all day just in case someone came nosing around. He said that just because they didn't last night doesn't mean they won't now. He said as low as the water's been lately, he'd be real surprised if someone hadn't stumbled across J.C.'s truck by now. Cecil asked him if they were going to stay all night, too, and Willard said that they sure were. But why would you stay all night? If anyone was to get nosy, they wouldn't come looking up here in the middle of the night, and the grave was empty now anyway. Cecil said that there wasn't a reason in the world why him and Roy Ed couldn't help carry the stuff back to the car and then work the mill like all of us were supposed to. Lindsay closed his eyes and shook his head slowly back and forth several times, while Ricky watched him and tried to figure out what had Lindsay so bothered at this point. Willard laid into him before Cecil knew what had him. Must have hit him eight or nine good licks and then threw him out the still house door. He went sprawling amongst the dirt and leaves and Willard was coming right behind him and he kicked him in the rear end two or three times. He kicked Cecil every time he tried to get up. And when he finally let Cecil stand up, he said that it didn't matter if anyone knew why he made the decisions he made. 
and that all that mattered was that everyone did what they were supposed to do. And then he said, if you must know, I want to see that bear for myself if it comes back. We put enough pieces of J.C. back in that hole to where that bear might come back and get some more. Cecil's nose had nearly stopped bleeding, and he said him and me could stay and watch for bears and people as well as Willard and Roy Ed could. That was when Willard got mean and ugly. Not violent, just mean and ugly. He said that we had sat there all night long listening to a bear come and dig J.C. up and tear him up and then drag him away after it already eaten part of J.C. And all we did was sit there with two loaded rifles and let it happen like a couple of little girls or a couple of panty waist boys would. And then he said that the Sun Ray filling station out by the highway didn't have enough air in that big tank to keep Daddy alive if he was to hear how cowardly we had acted. Lord, but I hope that old man dies before he ever finds out what you two are really made of, Willard said. And then he said the worst thing he ever said to us. He said he believed Mama must have been keeping company with someone because we sure didn't have any of Daddy Walton's blood in us. We didn't any of us speak again. We just left like Willard had said for us to do. Lindsay managed to say this before he completely fell apart. He cried silently, but he couldn't stop the racking sobs that were shaking his skinny body. And Ricky sat in silence and watched him until it was over. I'm awful sorry, Ricky. I didn't mean to carry on that way. But it just then dawned on me that those were the last words Willard ever said to me. I had disappointed him so much that he was accusing Mama of acting all trampy because Cecil and me weren't like him and Roy Ed and Daddy. I sure do wish he had something nicer as his last words to me. It would have been better to remember him in that way than with what he did say. It's all right, Lindsay. As much as he was trying not to show it, Willard was under a lot of pressure and he was scared too, said Ricky. There isn't any way in the world that he meant what he said to you and Cecil. I know that because I see a lot of tough men come in here for a lot less than what Willard and the rest of you all did. They say a lot of things when they're scared and the screws start turning tighter, but they don't mean a word of it. You just remember all the good times you had with Willard and forget about the last part. He was just talking big and tough so none of you three would see how rattled he truly was. It's what older brothers do. You remember that I have a younger brother too, so you can trust me on this, said Ricky. Ricky watched Lindsay perk up a little and sit a bit straighter in the chair. Now, Lindsay, unless there's something awfully important that happened with you and Cecil at the mill or at home that afternoon or night, I don't need to hear about any of that just now. Now, why don't you jump ahead and tell me about you two going back to collect Willard and Roy Ed? Can you do that for me, please? Ricky asked. Lindsay nodded his head up and down and then drank the last of the water in his red plastic cup. Ricky started to phone Joyce and have her bring in some more, but it felt like he had things back on track again and he didn't want to lose the groove. Besides, if Lindsay drank any more, he'd soon start hollering about needing to hit the head and heaven only knew when he might start talking again after a break outside of this office. He stopped worrying about the water when Lindsay began to speak again. So Cecil and me got up the next morning and ate breakfast with Mama. Annie Lee must have been feeling a touch better because she was already up and had the food nearly done. She didn't eat any of it though and she wouldn't look either one of us in the eye but she drank coffee beside Mama like she usually did. She kept holding Mama's hand after she had taken her seat. I think she would have started bawling if she hadn't been squeezing Mama's hand. Now, Daddy was asleep in his lift youth chair. He can't sleep flat on his back anymore. He says it feels like he's smothering to death when he tries. And because he can't breathe very good, he hasn't ever got any strength. So we all pitched in and got him one of those chairs you can stand straight up and all you have to do is walk away from it. He was snoring away when Cecil and me left out. Well, we rode by the new mill and checked to make sure that everything looked as it should. We were expecting to go meet up with Willard and Roy Ed and be back working in less than two hours. 
Well, that was the plan anyway, unless, of course, Willard had changed his mind about something. Everything Willard had said that morning still stung, but I think Cecil was trying to take my mind off of it because he kept talking about all we needed to get done. He was even talking about going and shooting some eight ball after we had finished. And then I started thinking about how a good cool one in a game would seem after the past couple of days and nights. And I started feeling better than I had in a while. And then we saw the still house with the door hanging off by one hinge and laying out in the yard because it didn't have a porch on it. Ricky, I wanted to sneak up on that place until I could see what was what because I figured Roy Ed had said the wrong thing and Willard had give it to him good. I didn't just want to go walking in on Willard till I saw what kind of mood he was in. Well, I think Cecil was thinking Willard had gone off the rails again too, but he didn't care and he wasn't going to wait another minute. He took off running towards the still house hollering for Roy Ed. They were always close anyway. I think it was because they were in the middle two boys. Willard was the oldest and I was the youngest and that left Roy Ed and Cecil in the middle. He hollered all the way until he was right up to the door. And then he just stopped and stared inside. He wasn't making a sound. Chapter five. Now Cecil told me not to come closer, but I didn't listen to him. I went anyway, and I was running for at least 50 feet. I didn't know what I was going to see, but I knew it was going to be worse than J.C. had been. I just knew it by the way Cecil was acting, and I'd never seen him look like that before. Well, I made it to the door, and I nudged Cecil out of the way a little. He wouldn't go inside, and I couldn't see around him. Ricky, you know how Halloween pumpkins look after they've been carved and then left to sit on the porch too long? They sort of start caving in on themselves and the face on the pumpkin gets a little warped looking like something from a spooky movie. Well, that's the way Roy Ed's face looked and that was the first thing I saw when I looked in the door. Bits and pieces of him were scattered all around the room. I could tell by the clothes that were still attached, but nothing was attached to his head any longer. It was just laying there looking up at me all twisted and collapsed. There were a lot of pieces of Willard lying around also, but I didn't see his head. We never did see his head. I think I'm glad about that. and I'm fair certain I'd as soon remember him frowning at me as to remember him like I'm going to remember Roy Ed forever. I don't think they could have been chewed up and strewn around any worse if they'd have been run through a wood chipper and then blown out. Ricky, in my worst nightmares, I never saw anything as bad as that. I know you're the sheriff and all, but I'll bet you anything you've never seen anything that bad either. Lindsay wanted to stop talking for a minute, and Ricky was glad enough to let him. To tell the truth, Ricky needed a minute for himself. Where did you bury... Ricky cleared his throat and tapped on his yellow pad with his pen a couple of times. Now, Lindsay, where did you and Cecil bury your two other brothers? Ricky asked. Bury them? Ricky, there wasn't anything there to bury except for Roy Ed's head, and neither one of us was brave enough to touch it. The only way we could have gotten all the pieces would have been in a bucket, and it didn't seem right doing that. We knew we should have done something with Roy Ed's head instead of leaving it there for some other animal to come and gnaw on it, but we just couldn't. I guess some robin or martin might end up making a nest inside of it one day. And I think Roy Ed might like that, actually. He always did love everything that lived out in the woods. You mean you two didn't bury him at all? When did you and Cecil find him this way? Ricky asked. Well, I told you there wasn't anything to bury. We left what was there laying there in the still house like we found him this morning, Lindsay said. Okay, we need to get back up there right now and see if we can figure out what happened to him, Ricky said. We know what killed him. It was a bear, likely the same one that ate J.C. His bloody damn tracks were all over the inside of the house. It's big tracks, Ricky. I mean big tracks, Lindsay said. Now you sit right there and don't you move until I come back and tell you to. You understand me, Lindsay? Ricky asked. 
Lindsay nodded just before Ricky ran out of the office. Everyone in the station heard Ricky as he shouted for Joyce. She had stepped into the room where the officers take their breaks to retrieve a bottle of pop. She came flying out into the hallway with a look on her face that said she was scared that she had really messed up something. Ricky didn't yell in public unless one of his officers had really dropped the ball. Joyce, I need you to get on the phone and find D.E. Mershow, and I mean I want you to find him now, Ricky said. I don't even know who that is, Joyce said as she sat down at her desk. Well, half the men in this station do, or their fathers do. Start asking. Find him and tell him to meet me at the Walton Sawmill, the old one, not the new one. Call me on the radio and tell me when he'll be there. I'm going there now and I'm taking Lindsay with me, Ricky said while he was walking back to his office. What if I can't get a hold of him? Joyce asked rather timidly. She knew what the answer was going to be before she asked the question, but she had to ask anyway. Like knowing a slice of pizza is still too hot to eat, but you have to stick it on your mouth all the same. Ricky whirled around to face her. Call me on the radio and tell me when he will meet me. And don't call me to say anything but that. I'm not going to hear it today. Ricky never went back to his office. He just reached inside the door to the standing coat rack and pulled his gun belt from one of the hooks. He was strapping it around his waist as he told Lindsay to grab his hat and follow him. Three officers stood in the holding area and watched as their boss rushed down the aisle toward the door. They had been waiting patiently for a while now so they could ask him this or that, but no one spoke as he pushed through the front door and was widening the gap between himself and Lindsay with every step. There were a lot of fresh car tire tracks for this to have been a sawmill that hadn't been used in some time. That was the type of thing you look for to give credence to a story like Lindsay had been telling. It wasn't that he necessarily doubted any or all of what the man had said. It was just that he was a Walton and you had to weigh each word before taking it as gospel. He hated having to judge things and people that way. If the story had come from almost anyone else, it wouldn't have been necessary. But almost no one would have ever come to him with a story like this one. Joyce had just called a few minutes earlier and told him that D.E. was on his way and would be there in about 15 minutes. The call had come five minutes ago, so he could show up in about 10. That would give him some time to see where J.C. had actually been killed. He had told Joyce to have two men get down to the low bridge to see if they could spot J.C.'s truck in the water, and confirmation of that would be just one more piece of proof. Amid the gravel and piles of sawdust, the stains of blood were unmistakable. They were directly under the rafters where Lindsay said they had strung J.C. up to beat him to death. The story had been hard to hear in the office, seeing that it was likely true was even harder. He looked over at Lindsay and saw that the young man was looking anywhere but where J.C. had died. Ricky didn't blame him. He was sorry, but Lindsay was going to have to see far worse than some blood-stained gravel before this day was over. The sound of tires on gravel made both the men's heads turn. D.E. had arrived. D.E. Mershow was a full-blooded Natchez Indian. Ricky hadn't sent for him because he was an Indian. He had sent for him because his grandfather had made a living tracking and killing bears and every other animal that roamed the wilds around the area, and he had raised D.E. to know everything that he knew. There wasn't anyone alive that knew more about what lived out in these swamps and ridges than D.E. Mershow knew. Ricky was going to have questions, and this man's answers were the only ones he was going to believe. Once, if you wanted to find D.E., you had to go to the woods and hunt for him, but now he was old and he made little money crafting dream catchers and napping arrowheads that he sold at a flea market. He might not chase bears any longer, but he still knew how, and Ricky needed the man's knowledge on this mess. Ricky was shaking the old man's hand before he had made it the third step away from his van. 
Lindsay stood still with his hands in his pockets. He and all the Walton boys had been raised not to like Indians and black men and Jewish men or men from up north as well. The Waltons rarely discriminated in their discrimination. What's got you worked up, Ricky? It better be good I'm missing my stories on TV for this, D.E. said. We've got a situation up here, Ricky said. You've got a situation. Well, I'm not wearing a badge. I'm going to go home and take a nap, D.E. said. Not this time. I need your help, so I'm drafting you. I might have a bear thing to figure out. Might have eaten a couple of men, Ricky said. There hasn't been a bear attack around here in quite some time. Not since I was a boy, D.E. said. It's not an attack, said Ricky. An eating from the way it sounds. I don't want to say any more until we've had a look. Now this is Lindsay Walton and his family owns the property. He's going to be our guide, Ricky said. I know who Lindsay is. I knew his grandfather and I liked him. Never quite saw eye to eye with his father, though, D.E. said. Well, my father wasn't too fond of you either from what I've heard, Lindsay said. Well, it doesn't matter. Your father isn't here, is he? Forget all that and take us to the house. We need to start understanding some things, Ricky said. Ricky and D.E. rolled eyes at each other after Lindsay had started walking toward the timber line. Because Lindsay knew the shortest way, although perhaps not the easiest way, it took less than an hour to arrive. Ricky's shirt was soaked through with sweat, and even though D.E. stood looking calm, you could see that the elderly man was a bit winded. The house was not what Ricky had been expecting. He hadn't planned on seeing some sort of rustic mansion, but he wasn't expecting what he saw. The woods had all but reclaimed the house. Ricky had grown up as woodsy as the Waltons had, but gave Willard and Roy Ed credit. They had spent the night in a place that you couldn't have paid Ricky enough to close his eyes in. The place fairly screamed of bad things waiting anyone who stayed. Lindsay started to lead the way up to where the front door used to be. It was still there, but now it was more in the yard than attached to the wall. D.E. tapped Ricky on the arm and then pointed at Lindsay and shook his head back and forth. And Ricky understood and called out to Lindsay, but in a softly loud whisper. Maybe it was the house, or maybe it was what had supposedly happened in it, but something made you want to be quiet around it. Lindsay, let's me and you hang back until D.E. sees everything fresh for himself. We'll step in if he needs details or answers, Ricky said. Lindsay gave the old man the stink eye, but didn't say anything as they passed each other. For long minutes, D.E. stood in the open doorway and observed all that was inside. Both men saw the face he made when he stared at Roy Ed's skull. Obviously, Ricky hadn't seen it for himself yet, but it looked like Lindsay had been telling the truth about it and without exaggeration. What could that old buck be looking for? The damn prints are on the floor just as red as a baboon's ass. A blind man could have told you it was a bear by now, Lindsay said. He isn't going to tell you how much to saw lumber. He isn't going to tell me how to be a sheriff. Neither one of us is going to tell him how to read a bear. Now shut up before you make matters worse than they already are, said Ricky. That old Indian was on Walton land, and Lindsay felt he had every right to be insolent. But he did as Ricky told him to do and kept his trap shut. How many men were killed here? I know it was at least two, but it's hard to be sure further than that, D.E. said after he had stepped away from the house. Ricky grabbed Lindsay's arm and squeezed. It's just the two men. That's all there were, Ricky said. Ricky leaned in next to Lindsay's ear and reminded him that this was now an investigation that he would do all the talking. There are more deaths than the two blowing in the wind through these trees, D.E. said. Ricky frowned. He knew good and well about J.C., but was hoping to keep as much information away from the public as long as he could. That is why he hadn't told D.E. anything, not even who the men in the still house were or had been. You gonna do a rain dance next? You've spouted your mystic nonsense, so dancing has to be the next thing, right? Lindsay asked. 
Lindsay, I'm not going to tell you again. Shut your mouth until I tell you to open it, or I'll gag you and slap bracelets on you. You've tested me for the last time, Ricky said. Lindsay looked like a pup that had just been hit with a magazine for pissing on the kitchen floor, but at least he had stopped talking. What did you mean by more deaths than two? This is just between you and me and the fence post, but there were only two of Lindsay's brothers in the house when the bear came, Ricky said. This wasn't a normal bear attack, Ricky, and you know it. No one has seen a bear big enough to mention around here for 40 years, and then all of a sudden one shows up and does this to two of the strongest and most woodsy savvy men in the county. It doesn't make sense to me, and it doesn't to you either, or you wouldn't have sent for me. One bear and two men like those two were? No, sir. Any other time a bear wouldn't have come near them. Something drew that bear here. That bear had a special way of thinking, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Unless, D.E. said. Unless what? Ricky asked. Unless there's more to all of this than what you've shown me or told me, and you've told me almost nothing. You keep something tucked away for a dessert, Sheriff? D.E. asked. Ricky looked over and saw that Lindsay had sat down on the ground with his back against a pine tree that had been stunted in its growth by the shade of all the oak and birch trees. His chin was resting on his chest and he was snoring. Ricky wanted to believe that the last three or so days had been unimaginably stressful on him, that he had finally just run out of gas but he was pretty sure that Lindsay was just one of those individuals who could fall asleep anywhere if he was allowed to be still. But either way, Ricky was glad that he was quiet and out of his hair for a few minutes. He took D.E. by the arm and led him around to the far side of the still house. Ricky looked at D.E. for a while as he chewed on his lip. He hated doing what he was about to do. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you something that only two people beside myself know. This can't go any further than us. And I mean, buddy, these words can't leave these woods. Comprende, amigo? Ricky asked. D.E. had been smiling, but that smile was gone now. You bet, Ricky. You tell me not to repeat something and it'll never be spoken again, D.E. said. Ricky moved a couple of steps closer to the old man so he could whisper it made him feel better doing it like that. This was Willard and Roy Ed that got sprayed all over the inside of that shack. But you were right. Those two weren't the only deaths. Night before last, Willard and the other three boys caught J.C. Plimpton messing around with their little sister, Annie Lee. They hung him up by the ankles in that shed that we parked beside and beat the boy to death with a couple of hickory handles. The next morning, they brought his body somewhere up not far from where we are standing and buried him shallow. And that night, a damn bear came and dug him up. Cecil and Lindsay could hear it happening because they were camped out inside just in case anyone got nosy about J.C., but they were too afraid to go out and try to stop it. Apparently, the bear ate a good bit of J.C. right at the grave and then dragged the rest of him away. Willard and Roy Ed wanted to see the bear if it came back, so they stayed here last night. Lindsay and Cecil found them like this when they got here. Now you know everything I know, but the only thing I know for sure is that this one is a gosh-awful mess, Ricky said. The old man had grown pale and Ricky had watched it happen. Where's the other one? D.E. asked. The other what? The other brother? I couldn't say just now. We haven't gotten around to talking about the living. I've kind of had my hands full hearing about all the dead ones. Why do you want to know? Ricky asked. You know how you're all the time hearing an Indian saying that this or that knowledge was passed down by our ancestors? I'm not saying it isn't true, but a lot of that knowledge is just common sense. And anyone might do the same as an Indian might if he thought about it first and hard enough. But some of the things we know... White people never will because they didn't have the opportunity to learn in the way that our ancestors learned. Centuries ago, before white people had ever heard of this country, we were already here. 
living with and learning about plants and the forest and the animals. The things those elders learned were passed down to sons and grandsons, and now I'm an old man who goes to the flea market and likes to eat hot dogs, but I still remember what my grandfather taught me because he told me not to forget. He told me that because his told him not to forget, and my grandfather told me many things that the ancestors learned while they were living beside the animals. And because of what I know, I'm going to tell you that this was not a bear that killed those two men. And Willard thought I was stupid, Lindsay said. Neither man noticed Lindsay when he had come around the corner of the still house. The tracks are there just as plain as day because they're painted on the floor out of blood of my two brothers, Lindsay said. Lindsay, pipe down. I already told you about running that mouth, Ricky said. It's all right, Sheriff. Lindsay's right, but so am I, said D.E. Ricky and Lindsay both said what at the same time. One of the things my grandfather taught me was to respect the power and strength of the bear. Everyone knows of the bear's physical capabilities. It is the bear's strength and power that I'm speaking of now. Many tribes knew of these powers besides the tribe of my people, and that is why the bear symbol is so revered. The bear has many gifts, and its spirit is very special to us. It's almost sacred. You saw the tracks of the bear inside the house, and you saw the destruction it visited upon your brothers. And by the way, I grieve with you, Lindsay, for your losses. It's a terrible thing losing a brother. To lose a pair of them on the same night is a pain beyond words, I'm sure. But as I was saying, you saw the signs and you know beyond a doubt that the bear did this thing to your family members. But the bear is not responsible. The bear was merely a vessel or a facilitator. The bear is not a carrion eater by choice, but it had to become one because the bear's purpose is to tidy the dead after passing. That entails many things, but chief among the requirements of that chore is to transport the spirit to the next life. The bear is entrusted with this because it is a brave and powerful animal and few would ever rise against it. The bear that did this thing did so because first it was transporting the spirit of J.C., the young man the four of you killed. He was an innocent man and he was killed in a way reserved for only the worst of mankind. He would never be able to rest with his spirit so confused and tormented because of what was done to him. Only by seeking and achieving revenge could the slate be wiped and rest be found for J.C. The bear was sent to collect his spirit and only by eating the body of J.C. could J.C.'s spirit enter the bear. And once his spirit was in the bear, the bear was as tormented as J.C. had been. The bear is only seeking peace for himself, and J.C. is to help in this. Ricky, you won't hear of any other innocent lives being taken by this bear. You have my word on that, D.E. said. Innocent, you say. Is that what you were talking about when you asked where Cecil was? Ricky asked. The bear will not stop until J.C. can rest. The man's spirit will not rest until all those who did this grievous thing are dead, D.E. said. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard, Lindsay said. Cecil is likely what that gal he's been shagging. He goes over there a lot because her husband's in prison doing a second out of nine to fifteen. Cecil's probably piled up asleep in her house on Lake Willow twenty miles from here. It's twenty miles by automobile, but for a bear it's only eight. Now, Lindsay, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid Ricky's deputies are going to find another brother of yours dead when he sends them over there to look for him, D.E. said. Well, what if you're right somehow? What does that mean about me? Lindsay shouted. The bear knows it cannot stop what it's doing, and it knows that it must continue until J.C. can rest. J.C. will not rest until he's fully avenged. J.C. can't be avenged until all who murdered him have been found. D.E. said this as he started walking back toward the sawmill and his van. Where are you going? Lindsay asked. The bear will not let anything or anyone interfere with what must be done, 
and I will not stand in its way even accidentally. Now I wish you luck, or at least an easy passing, Lindsay Walton, D.E. said as he disappeared into the trees. What are we going to do now? Lindsay asked the sheriff. You were a part of the terrible killing of an innocent man, Lindsay. Bear or the court. Either way, you're going to have to pay for what you did, Ricky said. Now hold on a damn minute. You have to protect me, Lindsay said. Or do I, Lindsay, or should I, Ricky asked. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I certainly hope you enjoy it. Special thanks to Jeff Crawford, who I'm finding out is a wonderful author. His author page at Amazon is going to be in the description below so that you can go there and look at all the books that he has for sale. This story was specifically written for this channel, but I'm hoping he writes more short stories and publishes a book with them because he's a really good writer. I've read uh, six of his books so far, and I'm about to crack uh, a new one. I'm going to get off the uh, Gun Hand series. There's six in that series, and I'm going to read a couple of his westerns. He just writes in all kinds of genres, and he just knows how to craft a good story, and I absolutely have found a good author that I love to follow. On the end screen will be an interview I did with Jeff uh, about a month ago. You guys are welcome to go look at it and get to know him better. All that said, thank you again for following along with this story and this podcast. If you thought it was worthy, give it a thumbs up. Maybe you could subscribe and make sure and come back for the next podcast. Love all of you, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.